Um, hello, everyone. So the, the talk is uh, on a rather obscure topic of BSD Unix uh, command line and text-based user interface ecology. If we simple it down a bit, it's just, um, it will be just clear ecology, really, because text-based text user interface is basically pods clear and pods GUI. Uh, and of course, CLI is usually BSD Unix. So what's that? What's, what am I talking about? What's, what's ecology? What's, uh, uh, what do I mean uh, when I say CLI? CLI? Is it, uh, what is it defined by? Is it defined by a terminal? A specific device? A specific, uh, specific piece of software that um, manages user input and uh, processes it? tools that you use when you use uh, any CLI? Or is it the process of uh, software development that you're virtually doing in real time when you're using uh, the interface? Or is it much more? Is it, is it none of these or any of these? But do we mean something more, uh, more whole and more general when we advocate common line user interface? So uh, I kind of, I'm kind of fascinated with, uh, with the idea of simple interfaces, but I'm also amazed at how few studies there are, there are about it. When you Google like, all the sources, you'll, you'll only get like maximum a few dozen studies. And actually, maybe half of those references will be patents. So actually, there's, there's a patent by IBM filed in 99 and uh, granted a few years later that basically <laughs> patents, <laughs> patents command line interface, but they do it in relation to network devices, but it's, uh, it's pretty much that. So user input, processing, batching and stuff. So how about a little bit, a tiny bit of history? Uh, the command line interface, uh, to the extent that we know it, basically starts with this guy. And this guy's name is Louis Poussin. He's French, but he worked in the 60s. He worked at MIT on CTSS. And it was a batching system, um, which obviously dealt with batches. But he wrote this nifty little program called Runcom for it, uh, which allowed users to to have this shell-like interface that they could manage their tasks in. And so everyone loved him, this guy and the program, because uh, they, through this Runcom interface, they could launch batches, and they didn't have to wait overnight for them to stay up in the university. They could just go home, and the, uh, the manager will, would, would solve the, all the kind of problems. And then uh, next year in 64, uh, Louis went on to work uh, with the Multics team before going back to France. And it was in that year when, they, when he was kind of toying with the Runcom principles and suggested them to the Multics team. And they, uh, all together, they came up with the word, the word shell for it. So that's the word, the term was born there then. And the Multics team loved the, the concept, so they adopted it. Uh, uh, by the way, the, this Louis guy is pretty interesting. I don't know if Kirk or, or anyone knows him personally, but later, in 72, he started working on the French internet, Cyclades, uh, which in, uh, implied invention of datagrams, packets, and generally heavily influenced Vin Cerf's uh, work on on uh, the real internet. Uh, when I speak about text user interface, it um, comes down to this guy, Bill Joy, um, who invented VI in 76. And to, uh, to make VI work uh, on, on terminals, uh, Bill had to invent this term cap uh, dictionary sort of uh, software, dictionary for terminal capabilities that allowed uh, him to easily port 
uh, the program to multiple, or him or others, to port this program to multiple different terminals. Uh, before the terminal uh, text-based user, text user interface were actually ex existing in other areas like on mainframes, but it's just with this, with, with TermCamp uh, term and VI, that uh, it became possible to code something for like interactive, um, interactive interaction, interactive uh, management of screen terminal and then it would work everywhere. So that gives uh, a, a punch or a boost. And then uh, there was this guy who can alert, who ported parts of VI into a separate library in 77, which, is, which was called Curses. It's actually more correct with uh, note that it's a library. And then every <laughs> everyone started using it. And of course, uh, the first use for it was was the rogue uh, game. Uh, then different people started working on courses and uh, introducing more and more support for, for more and more uh, terminals. So the, the modern version of uh, courses named and courses, new courses, was uh, born uh, as part of a GNU project in 93. And uh, basically ever since, it's just more support for more, ter more terminals and uh, Unicode support. But so what do I mean by ecology? How did that word get into, uh, get into the topic name? So uh, some time ago, I stumbled over this, uh, this very uh, interesting, captivating field named ecological interface design. Uh, what is ecological interface? So most interfaces and most, most desi uh, much design and most interfaces are designed quite in an uh, unscientific way. So let's take a quick look at uh, computer interfaces. This is Xerox uh, some 40 years ago. And then of course Steve Jobs came, came by and uh, his Apple Lisa, the, the first Apple computer with GUI and then the, this is Windows 95, like 20 years later. And uh, another uh, 10, 15 years later, this came by, it's uh, Mac OS X, the most advanced operating system, system in the world as we know it now. So, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Consumer, I missed the word, right. Uh, but if we look in this, at this in a quick succession, then we, we kind of have a chance to see that the progress that, that has been made is quite, uh, quite little. And it's, it would be a stretch to say that, it would be a stretch to suggest or to even suspect that a team of real scientists uh, sat down in a room and uh, looked uh, at all the data they have and kind of tried to construct a GUI in a very scientific and uh, mindful way. It doesn't, the, the way uh, these interfaces look, it doesn't suggest that, at least to me. I don't know about you. And it's not just about computer interfaces, it's about any interface out there. Uh, if we're lucky, we get some artistic qualities about that, like about them, like a sports car dashboard or of course, Hollywood movie computer interfaces like this in Minority Report or this in Matrix are always fascinating and very interesting. But in real world, we, we can only look at the exceptions of uh, the bad rule. And the exceptions are very, uh, very rare and far between. This is a fighter jet cockpit, uh, uh, a shuttle enterprise cockpit and nuclear power plant. So the exceptions are generally military, space, and uh, uh, very critical industries, mostly just nuclear power plant. And uh, it's, obvious, it's obvious why, because, uh, well, I'll, I'll touch on that later, but uh, it's obvious why the exceptions are what they are, because those are not consumer products, and they can't afford uh, any mistakes to be made. So they virtually have to hire scientists 
and to sit on, uh, on the designs and interfaces um, and come up with something uh, foolproof. But usually we get like GUI <laughs> like this. This is, uh, I think, GNU uh, WJET, uh, WGET, or like consumer products like this treadmill, which is, has not very positive reviews. When, when it gets to text interfaces, they, they tend to be even less scientific. Uh, they were first kept quite cool and uh, mindful thanks to severe limitations. For example, well, historically, limitations were quite severe, starting with manual, uh, manual control rooms and then to these slow teletype machines. Uh, early terminals and of course we get to this which is almost uh, almighty compared to older devices and uh, when it comes to modern terminals modern, modern terminal emulation modern computers they're so fast that the quality of software and uh, user interfaces is now completely at mercy of uh, particular developers working on new and old programs so most of it, even if it gets some thought, most of the designs uh, currently is, uh, follows uh, the so-called paradigm of user-centered design. And what it is, it's a very simple paradigm which implies that uh, actually this explicit uh, set of norms about it which says that user-centered design is about predetermined fully defined environment. We understand who the user is, we understand what all the tasks are, uh, whenever they will be, and uh, there are no exceptions. So it's all, it's all uh, uh, the, the workflow is completely bounded to something that we know before it started. Um, the user is involved in, in the design and actually each time we, we design we look at the user, what, what he says explicitly or not uh, about it and we iterate. And uh, it's all about procedures. So it's mostly, uh, if we know all the tasks, why do we need separate tools when we can just provide the buttons that are tied to all the procedures that we know about? Uh, so the ecological interface design came about as, uh, as an upgrade of that mindset. And uh, it started uh, with, with this guy named uh, Kim Vicente. Um, he's working, he's still working at the University of Toronto. Uh, but in the late 80s, uh, he joined effort with uh, researchers from a few other universities from across the world uh, Jens Rasmussen was, uh, well, probably from Sweden, I don't remember, but they kind of joined forces. There were some researchers from Japan too, uh, and they looked, they, w w what they had to do is, uh, w was to, to invent some ways to look at those critical military space and uh, other industries to come up with something more foolproof. Why? Because uh, actually, defense agencies started looking for uh, researchers in universities to help them with that. Uh, by the way, Apollo program was the first one that uh, really engaged a lot of scientists to work on uh, specifically interfaces. So they tried to, they, they, they looked at uh, how numbers are located on a keypad. Like, do we start from like seven, eight, nine, uh, and go down, or the other way around? They experimented, they tested every possibility, and they came up with a scientific way to uh, build a perfect interface. So this was, in the late 80s, there was uh, a critical mass of researchers willing to upgrade the field. And so they came up with this, uh, new ideology uh, of ecological interface design, which was more about complete, uh, which was centered not on users but workflows. So they analyzed uh, work domain uh, as opposed to analyzing uh, separate user tasks and uh, separate users. They analyzed the whole uh, workflow domain and they focused on uh, 
uh, on the cognitive part of, our con uh, of the control we exert on machines, not uh, the, the kind of key presses and button presses that some designers might focus on, like, you know, let's get these buttons together, but they focus on how in our minds we process interfaces and we uh, kind of tend to exert control and uh, build a mind, uh, mind base or internal to our minds, build maps of uh, interfaces that are much larger than what we see visually. And what, uh, what this approach allowed for was unanticipated tasks, because when you're in a fighter jet or uh, an Apollo program shuttlecraft or, um, or in a nuclear power plant, most of the dashboard functions before you are not for anticipated tasks. They are for unanticipated tasks. So you don't know uh, if, you, if you fly an F-15, you don't know uh, which model of uh, fighter jet would North Koreans or Russians fly at you. Or if you're in a nuclear power plant, you don't know if it will be a tsunami or a failure in, in some, or a structural failure or something else. So it, the, these types of interfaces are for unanticipated tasks. And it's based on, um, uh, on the notion that some systems are so complicated that uh, users can master, even professionals can master only a partial understanding of the whole system, of the whole, uh, uh, of the whole entirety of uh, constraints and complexity. So users don't understand how the systems work. And they have to cope very quickly with the very diverse sort of emergency tasks that they can't anticipate. So that's uh, the sort of environment the new ideology was built around. Um, and the, the research in the field, it wasn't the fruits of the research weren't specific to these emergency, uh, emergency style interfaces. In fact, the, uh, the area is so fascinated when, when I first stumbled uh, upon it, I immediately recognized that uh, the classic command line interface is a very good example of uh, ecological interface design. Why? Well, because uh, Obviously, it focuses, at least when we, when we look at FreeBSD based system or any BSD based system, uh, it focuses on instruments and empowering you uh, with these in instruments for arbitrary situations as opposed to fixed uh, procedures that um, that's what uh, GUIs are usually uh, more biased to. It's also uh, the, the classic CLI also implies that we don't understand the system completely. It actually, what it does, it does a really good job at progressive exposure of uh, different parts of the system to us. So we might, may start using a Unix system with just a few basic commands, but we then learn more and more and we feel more empowered and it, at each tier, at each level, uh, we, we feel in control. And of course it's, uh, it's workflow based because it, it was from the beginning designed uh, even though it's not about fixed procedures but, uh, but about instruments. From the beginning it was built around uh, certain workflows. If we take Unix it was about uh, f well different filing, administrative filing uh, workflows and uh, what they just did is uh, uh, find the right abstracts in the workflow and uh, materialize them in form of simple atomic commands. Another, uh, when speaking of workflow, workflow based design, uh, another fascinating topic is uh, flow based programming. The, some months ago I was kind of um, quite tired of, uh, well we, like most companies, we develop software. Uh, and uh, I was quite tired of lo looking at programmers cope with the tasks that, I don't know, if you, if you look at uh, current modern uh, uh, sort of enterprise coding, 
uh, much about it just uh, t w would tickle you the wrong way because people people tend to develop the same stuff over and over again, make the same mistakes. And I was just googling, you know, new paradigms paradigm, uh, in software, and then it it was recurrently redirecting me to flow-based programming. And uh, it was this guy, uh, Jean-Paul Morrison, and in 71 he, he published a paper named Data Responsive Programming, which he later uh, renamed to flow-based programming. And from then on he was uh, a huge advocate of it. He, he's actually Canadian and he convinced a major Canadian bank to switch to this kind of paradigm. And actually, uh, starting in the early 70s, a major Canadian bank, I, I keep forgetting its name because uh, I guess nobody cares to, to know because it's everywhere where flow-based programming is mentioned, the Canadian bank is mentioned as a major Canadian bank. And uh, never mind, but it's, it, it's real. And uh, they switched to this paradigm uh, back then, like 40 years ago, and they still run the same, uh, the same framework. It's sufficient to fulfill all their needs and the development is really simple. And when you look at, at the principles of uh, flow-based programming, it's all about building uh, these little black box style sort of software which is very versatile and very atomic in, in the conceptual sense. And then what happens is the program, the programming, boils down to uh, interconnecting all these black boxes, uh, all these tools between each other. And when you look at it, and if you have enough experience with uh, coding shell code, then you instantly recognize that that's exactly what you're doing uh, when you code born shell. It feels really natural. Uh, because that's what we do in real world. We don't build e everything from scratch. We have a lot of tools and we just know how to interconnect them. We have people, we, we know which information to pass back and forth. It's really addictive. Uh, most people say like, well, most people say that about Lisp too, but with flow-based <laughs> flow programming, it's, it's really, it seems to be addictive. Um, so there's a bank using it and Unix shell is about it. And I instantly understood that Really, I've been coding in, in this FBP manner for, for years, and that's why, uh, like any other style of coding, is a, a bit, uh, feels a bit not natural to me. So, back to, back to Clay for, uh, for a while. So, uh, what is it, what again is it defined by? Uh, the basic objects that are terminal, the, the terminal or any kind of media device, the interpreter and the tools that you use uh, through the interpreter. So if we look at terminals, we saw a few pictures uh, a few minutes ago, but the, the history, the terse history of it, uh, of them is very simple. So from the start of electronic computers in the 40s, they use manual switching, punch cards and basic teletypes. And then in 63, this uh, revolutionary teletype model 33 came around, which was really cheap, like 10 times uh, cheaper than anything in its class. It was just $700 for a keyboard. But it really rev revolutionary, revolutionized access to uh, computers. And then 70 years later, DEC came, uh, came up with this fascinating uh, series of uh, terminals, hardware terminals, starting with VT05, which was already already quite uh, quite kind of capable. Uh, it, it ran 72 per 20 characters on the screen, and then a few years later, VT100, of course, and then in the 80s there was uh, uh, there was more and more computers uh, with uh, bitmap access to, to the graphic cards and screens. So emulators uh, started to spring up here and there. And uh, just a for a quick look at the parallel universe, 
uh, IBM was, was, so what was happening in the mainframe world, which was all about uh, terminals. So it was pretty straightforward, um, and the interfaces, I, I assure you, haven't changed a bit in 50 years. So this is uh, what you see today when you use uh, the time sharing extensions for the, the very latest uh, the very latest version of mainframe operating system, ZOS, in IBM. It's, uh, it's half command based, half text based uh, user interface. Uh, most interaction happens through these text-based user, text user interface extensions, which is ISPF and TSO. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, back to the real world. So, uh, uh, the, with terminals, it's pretty straightforward. So emulators started springing up in the 80s, and we still use them every day. With interpreters, we saw that uh, Louis came up with Runcom in 63, uh, which then evolved into Multix shell. And then it was a pretty consistent history of, uh, uh, of shell evolution, uh, culminating with uh, I think born shell and C shell during the years that BSD was most uh, actively developed in. Um, of course, if you're not using Z shell by this time, you're doing something wrong. But it's not just about shells, it's also about simpler shells like what we're using FreeBSD for different boot stages like boot zero or loader. It's also like legacy systems with mainframes, but also mainframe-like systems like P, P systems, uh, power PC systems for enterprise. They use this Rex language, which is quite arcane and obsolete, but it's, it's kind of Perl-like and people love it. And uh, actually it's the, it, it has a huge open source community about it, uh, uh, dating back to 50s, but also active today. This PowerShell that I think introduced the most, the most uh, important introduction that Microsoft did in PowerShell was structured pipelining when they, they learned how to, they, they introduced the function to automatically serialize objects when you build a pipeline of them. Otherwise, it's mostly based on, on Unix. Of course, it, it has access to different proprietary APIs, but they took most of the inspiration from, from Unix. And of course there are uh, Perl, Ruby, Python and uh, interpreters for actually almost any other language, any other modern language. And I know a lot of programmers who, a lot of coders who actually do most of their tasking in, in let's say, in an interactive Ruby uh, shell. And it's not just about interpreting your input. It's about, it's also about how exactly do you input. For example, three or four, or maybe five years ago, I switched to VI mode on all my shells. And yeah, when, when random people come up to, to my terminal and try to do something with it, they get slightly surprised. But I, I tend to, to think that it's more, far more efficient. And obviously it's not just just uh, like the, the, the way you input data and edit it, but also history management and uh, everything that helps you do it. Um, and the most, uh, the most important and the, the biggest part of it all is of course the, the tools and components of the system, the, the black boxes that we connect, the, that we build collections, connections between. And the, the major players in the area was, uh, and are, of course, Unix, which bootstrapped and uh, ignited the whole process of this component development. Uh, and then BSD and GNU, of which I think BSD played and, uh, uh, and possibly still plays the, the critical role because uh, it attracted, it was the first to attract uh, at a critical time to, to attract a lot of researchers from many universities around the world. Uh, and by, by virtue of Kirk here and um, a few of his old pals, to sift through best innovations in command line interface utilities. To sift through them and to merge them into something 
uh, much more usable than the original Unix, much more usable than the later GNU reincarnations, uh, very clean and concise base, uh, base system, which we still f enjoy in, in uh, current BSD systems. Then there, there was obviously GNU, which uh, worked uh, mostly from mon, mon pages and uh, other documentation resources to re-implement re everything, uh, and basically what what the what, what kind of is obvious about the utilities is uh, they were happy to, to say okay the command line command line switches are too short let's let's get them longer and let's get more of them in. Um, but the original concept across all of, of all of the three camps was, of course, do one thing well for each utility, uh, and by that virtue we get flexibility, we get um, interoperability because uh, no one steps on each other's toes, and the whole uh, all of the interconnections between all of those tools were text-based, which was also quite a uh, advanced uh, decision and very virtuous decision because it allowed so much to be text is very versatile it allowed so much innovation built uh, to be built around the concept so uh, sooner or later uh, get out uh, uh, got to be the standard way of uh, processing uh, a common line arguments uh, mostly options and uh, their parameters. There, there are still two main flavors of it, get opt and get opt long. There are other flavors, uh, a, growing, uh, a growing number of them, uh, unfortunately. Uh, all they do, uh, like mo most of them are focused just on one or more of error handling, uh, automatic usage, uh, passage generation, and casting of parameters to correct values. So mostly useless. Um, so I, I did a quick GitHub study, I, I just some grabbing of uh, FreeBSD base. Uh, there were a few hundred GitHub calls and basically there was just, just about seven um, options per, per call, meaning just about seven options per, per tool uh, on average. And uh, a large, a significant uh, portion of that require parameters, uh, which from I, I couldn't get the hard data uh, in time. But from subjective looking at uh, base system scripts and the scripts and histories uh, in the wild, uh, only a fraction of this is actually used in the wild. In the wild, so what's happening? Um, uh, the, the other way to kind of extend uh, the other way to extend functionality is by using subcommands. Like we, we get RCS uh, in the base in FreeBSD base system, which is com which is composed of uh, several uh, t different tools like CI, CO, check in, check out, and then CVS and Subversion and Git ca come along. And instead of finding a modular way to kind of introduce themselves into the basic abstracts. What, uh, what is easier for them, what makes sense for them, is to introduce a whole other namespace. Uh, so it's now CVS, CI, CVS, CO, uh, which makes sense, but it, it actually in introduces some more complexity. So what I think is uh, happening is uh, massive specialization of uh, both tools and the options and parameters, uh, which invariably leads to loss of concepts. So if in the original and in the classic BSD Unix, most of the tools are almost conceptual. So there's no uh, like tool to, to copy files from, from hard drive to floppy. There's just copy, which does anything. So it's very close to concept. But now what we get, and especially with 20, what, 25, 27,000 ports, is massive specialization so, so that we get more and more utilities that are focused on a very narrow uh, task. And uh, there's no concept to describe that. So people 
it, it, it gets harder and harder to memorize and to, to grok the, the, the meaning of, of these uh, of special, specialized tools. I found a few studies on um, uh, com comparing CLI to GUI and text user interfaces. One of them said that they, they did a quite an interesting study. They, they took a few uh, two groups of people. They, they uh, tried to teach one of them a text, uh, a, a command line interface, and the other GUI-based interface. And they, uh, both of the interfaces did this, the very same thing, uh, like control a very simple process, but it, requ it still required learning. Um, and it turned out that people learned uh, equally quickly and remembered equally well uh, uh, both of these interfaces. But there's another study that says uh, that if you ask users afterwards, then they'll always prefer GUI, or most of them will, because it seems perceived ease of use and uh, perceived e ease of learning is uh, much higher for uh, visual interfaces, although it's not true altogether. So learning is like the, the real factual qualities are similar, but the perceived qualities for, for many people are much higher for uh, visual uh, interfaces. And uh, j just a few, uh, just a couple uh, other notes that, that you can, can pick up out of command line uh, interfaces is uh, thinking about how they uh, how they serve you in emergency procedures like you know backup what backup uh, so when it comes to when you really need to do something to solve a very massive problem really quickly uh, subjectively again uh, I, th I think it's much more efficient to get to the right stuff, uh, whether it's login review or quick fixes or, or quick scripting with uh, command line interfaces than, than GUIs. Um, and uh, what's fascinating about it is that mi the military solved the same problem. They, everything, ev everything they design is about emergency procedures, like what happens when the nuke falls. Uh, and seat belts are very, uh, closely related because when you have emergency procedures to do something very big very quickly then you must uh, make sure that you don't make it you don't do it by mistake or without meaning so that's why um, uh, I think you'll find sometimes that some programs could be made it could be named uh, a little bit closely like uh, the first the, I, I mean Literally, they could, uh, their names could be much more similar, but on purpose they were, uh, the, the creators chose the names uh, more distant from each other, not to allow people to mix them up. Uh, and the other wisdom is uh, something that I would call lamp naming. LZ compression is about finding the, uh, the, the stuff that that, that's most recurrent, most frequent, and assigning the shortest name to it. So it's all about classic Unix. You, you find uh, whatever you're using the most tends to, be, tends to have a very short name. And that allows, if you, if you marry that to, uh, to the right names, uh, like contractions of real, worlds, of real words, then uh, you get instantaneous uh, mnemonical retention because uh, because it, it all adds up uh, even if the contraction is very terse uh, if it's really short that means you use it very frequently and it makes no effort for you to learn it if it's slightly longer then uh, it, it gets even more similar to the original title of the concept and so it's really easy to uh, to learn Unix for most people. So thanks, and this is a, a kind of experimental or uh, kind of obscure and little covered topic. So uh, if you want to, to kind of for the five, two, three minutes that we have to discuss any parts of it, 
you're welcome. If not, then off to refreshments.